Okay, welcome back everybody. Um, we are continuing our lecture of BC 310, Church and Ministry Management. Uh, Evanson, I see your request about the book. I guess I will uh, share it. Uh, just give me a day or two. I am just trying to shortlist which book to share. I don't want to put five books there and you know not read. Um, it won't be of use. Uh, I, I just wanted to share one book, which you know uh, all of us could read, uh, and so I will do that. I'm just trying to think which would be the best book to share. Christopher, your question, please. Oh, yes, Pastor. In in reference, this is in reference to one Corinthians uh, twelve twenty eight. Uh, in the NKJV version, uh, where there's a use of the words uh, first, second, after, and then. So I just wanted to understand um, uh, from an organization perspective, uh, does this imply there's a, there's a kind of a hierarchy? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's kind of interesting. Good question. Um, the word uh, first. Um, uh, is the word, the Greek word is proton, which has to do with being first in time and first in place. So uh, the apostle, so if you look at the Greek word for apostle, somebody who was sent, and the way it was used, um, it was used in the Roman military for that very first fleet of ships that went in to invade and take over territory, the very first. So they were first in time and first in place. So that, that was you know, the picture around which the word apostle was understood. So the apostle is first, not in the sense that they're of a better quality or, you know, if they're we're all, we're all people. But I think an English word that would capture what is, you know, the, the picture from the, the Roman context would be the English word would be pioneer. So they're first in the sense they're pioneers. They're first in time and first to get there. You know, like the, the first ship in the fleet of ships that would go to invade a territory. So when Paul is giving us and he says, you know, first apostle, doesn't mean the apostle is better as a person than somebody who's an evangelist or somebody, you know, no. It's that he's in rank, yes, he's important, but that for the emphasis of that first is he's of this nature, first in time, first in the place, pioneer kind of person. And yes, in terms of leadership, in terms of a hierarchy, uh, the apostle carried a lot of responsibility uh, because he would be the one to make sure that what the Roman government wanted to bring in, basically they wanted to extend their kingdom, meaning bring in the culture and uh, the, basically the culture and the government into that region, right? So he was responsible to make sure that happened. So therefore, he had the rank and the authority to do that. So that's how we should understand first apostles. So not that they are better in quality or nature, but they are they are in pioneers uh, in terms of being first in time and place. They are in government or in uh, order of responsibility. They carry acts of first apostles, prophets, teachers, and so on. Uh, is that okay? Yes, thank you. Okay. Welcome. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, what I want to, um, since we are here in First Corinthians 12, I'll just make, make mention of this that, you know, uh, we have just mentioned about this whole rank and, you know, first apostles, prophets, and then you find later on in the, in the order there is helps and administrations and varieties of tongues. But I want you to keep this thought in mind. When you read the whole chapter, 1 Corinthians 12, 
Paul mentions this. He says, God gives greater honor to that which is less visible. Right? So this is in there. Uh, just even if you look, go back a few verses, uh, verse 23 and 24, uh, uh, you know, he's saying, look, you know, the way God has organized this is what we think as less honorable, God actually gives greater honor. He gives greater honor to what that those members were less visible. So in the general church context, what is more visible receives more honor. But in God's perspective, God gives greater honor to what is less visible. This is, you know, verse 22, 23, 24. So we may tend to think, hey, I'm just helping. I'm just, administ you know, an administrator. I'm doing that kind of work. You know, uh, I don't have as much <laughs> honor as somebody who's a apostle or a prophet or a teacher, etc. But keep in mind, God sees it differently. He gives greater honor to what is invisible, what is not very, you know, it isn't, isn't seen. So we shouldn't, you know, think of people who are serving as helps or administrators, uh, that is in the organization side of the church, uh, we shouldn't think of them as, uh, you know, uh, of, uh, being of any less importance. In fact, you know, the, the, the truth is, without them, we really would not be able to do so much of what we're doing, having the reach and the impact and the influence uh, that God uh, gives to uh, the spiritual minister. Right? So it's very important. They're both important. Okay. Uh, let's just continue on the notes. I'll go ahead and share that. So. We have, uh, yeah, so we were on first quarter, it's 12, 28. Uh, so what we're doing is we're just trying to establish from this Old Testament and the New Testament that this whole part of ministry, which has to deal with administration, organization, all of that is actually very biblical and it is very important, right? That, that God is for it, God is not against it. Uh, one last set of scriptures we'll see is that in Paul's episode, uh, he admonishes or he encourages order within the local church. You know, in First Corinthians 11 and verse 34, we are, we are right there, First Corinthians 11, 34, uh, when it comes to, you know, when people are coming to receive the Holy Communion, the Lord's table, he tells them, you know, when you come together, you know, uh, uh, you know, I want you to do this properly, orderly. And he mentions in First Corinthians eleven thirty four, he says, "The rest I will set in order when I come." That means there are certain things that are not, you know, not functioning properly in the church. In this case, the Corinthian church. And he says, "I'm going to set those things in order." First Corinthians fourteen forty, which we just read earlier, he says, "Let all things be done decently and in order." So there is some sort of a structure. And if there is going to be order, there has to be structure, you know, the right thing in the right place. And uh, so there is structure, there is order that is to be maintained in the local church. Same thing in Titus chapter 1 verse 5, and Paul is writing to Titus, he says, Titus, I want you to set in order the things that need to be taken care of in the churches, right? So uh, he's uh, encouraging Titus, you know, things have to be in order. Now, uh, so this is the spiritual side. That means we've gone through chapter and verse in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament to substantiate what we are emphasizing, that is organization and administration is part and parcel of the work of God. Some people find it very difficult, but I hope, uh, difficult to accept what, what I've just said, but I hope, you know, by looking at both the Old Testament and the New Testament, uh, we are able to, you know, accept that, I, the truth that it is part of the work of God, that organization and administration is not separate. Right? It is part of God's work. Right? Now, let's look at things from a, you know, a practical perspective. 
Uh, in why is organizational administration important from a practical perspective? First of all, in today's world, and especially in an urban context, there is a, a need, and in fact, there is an expectation for efficiency. Uh, people in the congregation, they expect the local church to be organized and efficient, especially in the urban context. You know, uh, <clears throat> so when people, example, just think about a Sunday morning church service. When they come, and if you say the service is going to start at 10 o'clock, they expect the service to start at 10 o'clock. Nobody's, you know, coming there thinking, hey, we don't know exactly what time the service will start. Maybe 10, maybe 10.15, 10 maybe 10.30. No. In the urban context, people are very time conscious. If you say 10, they expect it to start at 10. Uh, they expect the church to be organized. That means, you know, uh, that's not 10 o'clock is not the time that the band comes to the stage and starts connecting their the start. So uh, they expect these kinds of things. Similarly, you know, uh, uh, there are other things. You know, maybe they need a letter from the church saying that they are members of the church in order to, you know, uh, maybe for school admission, college admission, for other practical things, you know, they may need a baptism certificate, they may need, you know, uh, 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 other things, a marriage certificate, so on. So all these things are very practical things, uh, which, in, you know, the people expect from the church. It means the church has to be organized in order to provide that kind of service. So we can't escape that. Secondly, from a practical perspective, people want to serve. They're willing to serve, volunteer, with their, skill, with their skills and with their time. They're willing to serve. And they want to serve. They don't want to be just spectators. But in order to facilitate this, in order for them to be able to serve, we have to be organized. We can't just say, you know, do whatever you want. Uh, it won't work. You know, they expect us to be organized, uh, and they all, uh, we also need to be organized to enable people to be part of the life and the, the functioning of the church. So, in your church, you would have teams. You know, you uh, volunteer teams. Okay, there's a media team. There's a sound team. There's a you know, uh, 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 information desk, the team over there, there's the people handling the publications, the various teams, and it has to be organized. Each team needs to know what people do, and then people in the congregation, the volunteers, just plug in to these various teams. They're trained, they know what to do, they can solve. But if you're not organized, it's going to be very difficult. You know, just, okay, I'll just do whatever you want today. You know, then many things will uh, be left undone. People will know what to do uh, and how to serve. So in order to meaningfully engage volunteers in the church, in order to meaningfully engage con members in the church uh, and be part of what is happening, we need to be organized. A third reason why you know, uh, being organized, uh, the proper administration organization of the church is that uh, we, in the world in which we live, the modern world, or the postmodern world, expects that the church be competent in many areas. Yeah, they expect that. They expect the church to be able to use technology in order to serve them. So, for example, uh, they expect the church to be able to send emails. You know, they expect the, the church to be able to connect with them through a, you know, through a website, through you know, a WhatsApp message, or you know, various things that, that can be done. So they expect the church to be doing that, uh, that the church should have these competencies. So now in order for, the, you know, it's not just about, okay, you come to church and I give you a sermon on Sunday. Hey, I'd like to download the sermon on Monday and listen to it again. You know, or I like to go back to a sermon that, that you preached, you know, one year ago, and I want to 
be able to listen to it, whatever. Because the, the means to do it is there, and they expect the church to be using that to serve the people. Otherwise, they'll ask, you know, why can't the church do it? Because everybody else around is doing it. They, you know, they're engaging or making use of these uh, tools and technologies that are available. The church should be able to do that. So uh, it, it just required, you know, the world around us requires us to be uh, using uh, such tools and to be competent in using such tools to serve them. Uh, these are three just simple practical reasons. Um, uh, does anybody else want to add some to this? Any other thoughts on, you know, why do you, some practical reasons on why the church should be organized, should have good administration? You want to share your thoughts? Anybody else? I just mentioned three. Yeah. You want to share anything? Harrison, go ahead. Thank you. Good morning from here. Good morning, Harrison. Yeah, um, there are some few things I've experienced in my church. Yes, and um, it, gives, it gives a lot of concern. And I love this topic you know, we are treating today. Because when we're not organized, it brings confusion. Mm. But when we organize, there's no room for confusion. It makes everybody knows what they are doing. You don't need to be told you know what to do before you do them. Because when the house is organized, everybody's prompt you know with the activities. There's no room for eye service. Mm -hmm. because nobody is coming to tell you what to do and what not to do. So I believe when the house is organized, there's no room for confusion. So that's what I want to uh, thank. Mm. Good. Very good. Thank you for sharing that. And that is so true. Right? When, when you're organized, everybody knows, hey, this is what I need, I'm going to do. You don't need somebody coming and telling you every time, every day, oh, this is what you're supposed to do. No. Things work. Um, beautifully, right? but that's, I mean, that's again a very practical reason why we need to have good organization and and administration. Anybody else? Any other thoughts you want to add to it? Go ahead, Ben. Well, I believe the reason the church needs to be organized is because God is an organized God. Everything is that he does is so perfect and so, you know, professional, you should say. God is a good professional. <laughs> and if mm -hmm. you, even in the book of Genesis, you see him in doing everything in proper order. So mm -hmm. basically, the church has to be in order because the God whom we serve is a God of order. Mm -hmm. So that's all I right. wanted to say. That's good. Yeah. So we need to imitate God. And God is a God of order, a structure. And Design. Um, yeah, sorry, who's, who's that, Kennedy? Or? I have a question. I have a okay, question. Hope. Hope. go ahead. Thank you, Pastor. You know, uh, we learned that we must have organization in our churches, but a big problem in uh, African churches it is an organization. Uh, people or leaders say that to be organized, it is to give Holy Spirit or booster call in working. So they, a lot of churches, they do not want to organize things. They say that if you do a lot of organization, uh, you, will, you will make Holy Spirit fail to do his work. So sometimes you, 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 you eat in a church, you don't know the time of of, of going out of the church. So you can eat at morning, but you do not know where, where, when are you going to depart. And when you ask questions, say, you you, you don't be a fleshly kind of man. You must not, you must not uh, plan to go out of that presence until he himself wants. So can you help us in, in such scenarios? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> good, good, good thought. Um, so, you know, one is uh, we have been, you know, trying to see in scripture that a good organization does not keep, you know, God out. So, for example, in First Corinthians 14, where Paul is really talking about the gift of the Spirit, the work of the Spirit, in that same chapter, he says, you know, everything must be done decently and in order. Uh, God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. Uh, and, you know, in it, it, Paul is, is an apostle, he's filled with the Spirit. But at the same time, he thinks there has to be order in the church. So we have to learn how to blend the two. Uh, our organization should be to facilitate and to administer the ministry of the Spirit. Our organization is not to keep the Spirit of God out, but it is to more effectively and properly bring the ministry of the Spirit to people. So that is how, you know, if we tell people, look, organization and the work of the Spirit are not separate. The Holy Spirit is very organized. He is not the God of confusion. He is the God of order. And so when the Holy Spirit moves, he will move that way. Now we are very, very open to anything the Spirit of God wants to do. To answer your uh, the other part of your question, which is, you know, hey, uh, you know, we can enter in. We don't know when we will finish uh, the service. Uh, I think our approach should be, look, we have an order. This is what we're going to do. We're going to spend so much time in worship. We're going to spend so much time in the, the Word, and then we will dismiss. But this is our order. This is what we're planning to do, and this is how we have allocated our time. But if we are going to remain completely submitted and open to the move of the Spirit. So if and when the Spirit of God wants to do something different, we will flow. But we will not do it in the flesh. And we will not unnecessarily make it a three-hour service or five-hour service just for the sake of doing it. We, if it's a genuine work of the Spirit, he'll, you know, we will flow with it. But otherwise, in this time that we have allocated, God will move. God will minister to us during the time of worship, during the time of the word. And there is nothing wrong with that. Uh, so we have an order, like Paul says in First Corinthians 14, but we remain open. And then we flow with the Spirit. So I think there's that balance where, uh, because even this extended time sometimes could be just fleshly, meaning, you know, just somebody wants to sing, they keep on singing, or somebody wants to preach and they keep on preaching. Well, it's not of any use if people are tired, or people are not paying attention, or people are disconnected. It's not serving any purpose. So uh, we will have to balance the two. That's how I would kind of respond to that. And, uh, you know, um, and, and go for it. I think an interesting scripture is in Second Corinthians chapter one. Um, uh, if you look at it there, uh, Second Corinthians. Which one is somebody can read that? One, two, one. Second Corinthians one and verse no, seven. He may not actually have to come. Ooh. I think this is my zone. <laughs> Second Corinthians one seventeen. Somebody can read that for us, please. Can I read first? Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Second Corinthians chapter one verse one. Uh, Paul an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy uh, one, our brother. Sorry. Second Corinthians one verse seventeen. When I therefore was 
thus minded it, I use the lightness or the things that I purpose do. I purpose. I purpose do. I purpose according to the flesh, that with me there should be ya ya and nay nay. Okay. So uh, Paul is talking about how he makes his travel plan. Right. And in, 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 in the previous verse, in verse 16, he's talking, writing the Corinthians and saying, look, you know, I plan to come uh, through Macedonia and then go through Corinth. And then from there, I plan to go to Judea. So he was just saying, you know, this was what I was planning. So he's talking about his travel plan. And this is ministry plan, ministry travel plan. And in that context, in verse 17, he says, you know, the plans that I make, that is my travel plan, do I do this lightly? I mean, do I do this just at random, frivolously? No. And do I plan according to the flesh? That means, am I just doing it, you know, by my own? There's no. That that there should be yes, yes, and no, no. That's, uh, should I just keep on changing my plan? You know, that uh, that my word is not something you can hold. So uh, just going by the context here, and Paul is talking about travel plans, and he's saying, you know, uh, when I am, the implication is that when, when I am planning things, uh, I am planning by the Holy Spirit. I'm listening to the Spirit. But at the same time, uh, there could be change. It's not that I am saying yes, yes, and no, no. Uh, and if you read uh, you know, what he wrote to the Thessalonians later on in Second Thessalonians chapter 3, he says, you know, I plan to come, but Satan hindered. So he faced a genuine obstacle. He faced different things that were uh, disturbing or trying to interrupt or hinder his travel plans. But the point he's making is, the plans he's making to travel and minister, he's doing it by the spirit. He's not doing it lightly. So there is planning, but there's spirit-led planning. So if you try to do that for the local church service, you know we plan, but we're open to the Holy Spirit and we move as the Spirit enables us to do. Okay. Um, yeah, Kennedy, I see your comments in the chat. You know, for security reasons. We need to have administration to comply with uh, local authorities. We need to be properly organized. Yeah, for all of these reasons. So at least uh, move forward, and then maybe I'll just share some practical things that we do here. Share. Okay, so a practical perspective. Now, here are some common excuses, you know, that we would find uh, for poor organization, administration, or you know, sometimes even. Uh, for the lack of these things. For example, some people will say, hey, uh, I, I've not been trained, you know. Uh, I didn't learn this in seminary, and I didn't, they didn't teach me about organization and management and leadership. And that, that could be an excuse why, uh, you know, there is, a, uh, there is no proper administration of an organization of uh, the church or the ministry. Uh, sometimes we say, you know, the, another excuse be, hey, we don't have skilled people. Well, uh, we don't have the means to hire skilled staff. Well, that's where volunteers can come and there are people in the congregation who are helpers, who are administrators, and they, they will be more than happy, you know, to volunteer. We just have to give them the opportunity. We just have to let them know there's a need and uh, make it possible for them to come in and and use their skills to volunteer and serve in the church. And we can start from there. And then as the work grows, you know, we'll be able to hire skilled staff. Sometimes uh, there is this whole spiritual side, you know, oh, ministry must only be done by spiritual people. Uh, we, we, you know, church, church doesn't need uh, administrators and, you know, skilled people, these secular people. And so in, in the minds of uh, many there is a divide you know spiritual people and secular people but actually you see here right when we read in first Corinthians 12 28 you know administrators they are spiritual people uh, you know uh, the deacons were people who are filled with the holy spirit and with the wisdom of god and they were the ones who were taking care of uh, the business of the church so uh, we need to get this wrong i get rid of this wrong idea uh, that you know there are mm, the people who are doing you know um, uh, the helps and administrations are non-spiritual. No, no, no. They too are filled with the spirit of wisdom. They too are filled by the spirit of God. 
just that they're expressing their gift, grace, and anointing through these means of administration and organization and so on. Uh, another excuse you'll find is that uh, you know, you'll hear about is uh, no, the church must only focus on spiritual things. Of course, we uh, are doing spiritual ministry, but then we need the organization to back up that spiritual ministry. Right? So the folk, the the church is serving spirit people spiritually through the ministry of the word and in prayer and worship, but that spiritual ministry needs to be backed up by a very good organization and administration. And then, you know, similar to that, people would say, no, no, uh, the moment you get organized and uh, administrated, it becomes like the corporate, you know, like I mentioned uh, in, the, in the previous lecture, you know, it becomes like the corporate, and we don't want to become like the corporate world. Well, you don't, you don't have to have uh, a corporate look and feel. I mean, we can be organized and be fully saturated with the Holy Spirit, and we can be organized and have a culture of love and uh, of the kingdom of God, of righteousness, peace, and joy. So just because we're organized and just because we have systems and processes and uh, in a certain ways, it doesn't mean we become uh, like the corporate. No, we can have all the organization and be saturated with the kingdom of God. You know, so that's something. And then we'll talk about that when we talk about workplace culture and also church culture, that we create that culture while we are organizing. So that's a very beautiful environment where people can come, they can use their skills, they can you know, do their regular work, but it's a totally different atmosphere. Right? And uh, uh, last uh, uh, excuse people give for not wanting to organize and not wanting administration is this is God's work. you know, And uh, organizing and administrating is fleshly, it's human. Uh, we shouldn't uh, mix the two. Well, like we saw from Scripture in you know, Old Testament and New Testament, that God's work has organization and administration as part of it. And it's not separated. And we can go through all the Scriptures that we went through. It's very much a part of God's work. So the people who are doing administration and organization, they are doing God's work. It's just, it's just that it is expressed differently, different from preaching and teaching and worship and so on. They're also doing uh, the work of God. And so we can, you know, overcome uh, m many of these excuses uh, that people put out uh, in trying to say why they don't want to be organized or why they don't like administration. We can respond to this. And I and, and some of you have al also shared, you know, uh, some of the reasons why uh, people don't like uh, good organization and administration. Any other thoughts from your side? Um, what are, uh, what would be the excuses if if, if you've encountered any uh, on uh, you know why people uh, would stay uh, away or don't want? Uh, or good uh, administration organization. Any excuses you've encountered? Yeah. Okay. So um, I just wonder whether to get in the next chapter or just. Uh, uh, give some, you know, examples. For for instance, you know, um, uh, here at APC, uh, even for, let's say, a publication, right, our books. So we we started printing books, you know, from the very beginning, which is back in 2000, 2001. So that's how I write a book. Now, I, whether it's a small book or whatever, I write it. It's one thing to write a, a book, but this book now, for it to really bless people, it has to reach the people, right? And in order to do that, you know, how, you know, what is the process? And we get into some of these details uh, later on as we talk about systems and processes. But I'm just giving you an idea. So if I write a book and I send it to the printer. 
Now, um, right now we have like a, a publications team. So there will be somebody who reads it. Uh, we have an editor. And she will, uh, you know, she's, she's trained in this. She's an editor. So she will read, she'll edit, she'll check the, the language, the grammar, you know, all of those things and the formatting, the layout, all. Attention to it, right? I'm just trying to capture certain insights in the book. But she take, she will take care of all of that, you know, how to hold the work of an editor to make sure that, you know, uh, 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 as far as possible, the mistakes are not there. Then it, it goes to the printer. The printer will typeset it, send the proof back. The proof has to be read. The corrections have to go back to the printer. The printer makes a correction, sends another proof. So that back and forth can take, you know, about three iterations back and forth until all the errors, you know, have been addressed. And sometimes some errors still, you know, slip through. But as far as possible, the iterations happen between our editor, editorial team and uh, editorial and proofreading team and the printer. The proof is read many times, all the corrections. Then when the editor says, okay, go ahead and print, then they will print. Now printing gets the book physical, but then how does it reach the people? Well, they send the copies back to us. Now we have a database. We have a database of bookstores around the country. We have a database of individuals around the country, pastors, Christian leaders. Okay, I think um, I temporarily lost connection. You can hear me now? Yes, sir. Yes. Oh, strange. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. So what I'm saying, so we have a team here who will, you know, dispatch the books. And, um, and uh, of course, we work along with the printers, along with our local post office, because these are, you know, bulk, they go out in big boxes, or we work with the local courier, so we have all of this in place so we can go and deliver, you know, boxes of books with the label or to go to the bookstores. And we can deliver hundreds of packets to the post office and they just stamp it uh, to go out to, you know, pastors and individuals like that for English. So that work has to happen. And then it goes and reaches the people. It goes into the bookstores and so on. So writing a book is one thing, but to get it to the people, there's you know there's a lot of people involved uh, doing work in order for the book to reach, and then it will reach somebody, it'll reach their doorstep, or it will reach a bookstore, and then somebody gets it in the bookstore, and so on, you know. And then that's when when somebody picks it up and reads it, that's when it is uh, a blessing to people. But if that whole all of that is not in place, um, writing the book. You know, really doesn't reach the people who need to, uh, whom it needs to reach. And of course, at the same time, we also have an online team. So the moment the book is produced, it goes up on our website. Um, then it's distributed to dig digital channels. You know, so there are about 30, 40 uh, digital channels through which that book, the PDF book, and the digital version of the book uh, is distributed globally. So somebody sitting in some part of the world when they search online for a book by that, you know, topic or theme, hopefully, uh, you know, this book will show up there and they could get access to it. So there is a physical distribution, there is a digital distribution, but there are all people who are involved in making this happen. You know, so without their help, or without what they are doing, which is, you know, basically a lot of work that's behind the scenes, nobody sees it, uh, without their help, uh, this will not, go out to the people. So we have to be organized. And all of many of these people are paid people, right? And then when an English book is released, it is then translated into other languages. So we have translators, somebody coordinating the translation and, 
again, the translated books go through a similar process. So all this happens with just one book. And imagine you have many books, all these things are happening and need to be organized in order to serve people well. So just one example of you know uh, one area of ministry, and like this, if you have many different areas of ministry, if you're doing media, if you're doing uh, devotional programs, if you're doing different things, you will need teams who are very organized, and you need skilled people and uh, and staff, and you know who will be able to do all this work in order just to serve the people. Right? So somebody can you know listen to the devotional on their phone or you know, on, 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 on the web website, wherever. You need people who will actually help get uh, these things up. So the organization part is very important. The people who do that are very important. Okay, so we will uh, talk more on this um, as we go along. Any questions before we close up for the day? I'm not sure if I missed any. Um, Okay, I see Kennedy's question, and I also see Mangi's hand. Uh, let me answer Kennedy's question. Kennedy's question is, um, where churches are managed like personal properties. Yeah, Kennedy, that's a, that's a bad thing. <laughs> uh, churches must not be uh, treated like it's somebody's personal private business. Uh, that is very bad. Um, but the sad thing is it does happen, you know. Uh, sometimes, uh, and I've seen this also, and you've probably also seen it, where uh, the personal and the church things are all mixed up, and you know uh, the church is treated as though it's like a pastor's house, or all kinds of things happen, and uh, that that should not be. And so, what we will be learning as we progress in this course is how to do things right, how to organize and you know run the ministry uh, properly without you know making these kinds of mistakes and treating it like a private business or a personal uh, property we should avoid that we will learn how to do things right mangi your question please thank you sir um just want to uh to ask uh because our our, our church we go through our, our local church we are very uh organized however there are few people in in, in the organization who who are dis disorganized, they don't like the idea of being organized and start on time. Um, how do you balance between being organized, the super organized one, and those who who bring in chaos? Thank you, sir. Mm. So I I'm just thinking out loud. Uh, I, I'm not sure there is a perfect answer, but for the people, see, here's, here's, the, here's the thing, and I'm not saying these are the kind of people you're dealing with, but generally uh, creative people, people who like their space, you know, who like, they don't like rigid structures. Uh, generally creative people are like that. You know, they just, they, they want the freedom, they don't like too much of um, boundaries and so on, like, you know, artistic, musicians, creative people, generally I like that. So we recognize that and therefore we give them their space in what they are doing, but if they want to serve, they have to comply to how the organization functions. They can have their space in other matters, for example. Generally speaking, you know, musicians are creative people. But if the church service is going to start at 10 o'clock, they have to get everything ready and be ready to start at 10. So that's non-negotiable. They can be creative, you know, when they're practicing, when they are doing what they want, you do, you know, that's fine. But when you come, the service must start at 10. That's non-negotiable. And then, while they're leading worship, they will slow in the spirit. Yes, they have this song list. They may have practiced a few songs, but then the Holy Spirit may lead them differently. They're free to flow, right? Uh, so there is, you know, there are certain things that we emphasize and say this has to happen, and then there is space for their freedom. If somebody is just 
plain disorganized. That is, it's not this case of you know being creative, but they're just plain disorganized. Then you cannot give them roles or give them uh, responsibilities uh, that require you know commitment and organization. So you have to you know keep them away from those roles and let's give them roles which okay even if they don't do it it's not going to impact you know for example they can be greeters yeah if they don't show up it's okay somebody else can stand and greet you know it's not a thing it doesn't matter but they cannot be in the for example in the sound team because that has to happen and if a sound person doesn't show up people are not going to be able to hear the you know hear uh, the sound so if they're to be there they will be there so for people who are disorganized, who are not uh, really, you know, committed, they don't understand those things. Then you give them roles that are uh, that will not impact what has to happen, even if they don't show up. If they do show up, wonderful. If they don't show up, no problem. Things will still go on. So that's kind of some thoughts I would give in response to your question. Um, is that okay? Thank you, sir. Yes, please. Thank you. All right. Uh, any other questions? Any other thoughts before we wrap up? Okay. So we can close in prayer. We'll pick this up next week. We'll get into more details. And as we get into details, I hope we'll find it more interesting. Uh, uh, you know, we will talk about you know, how to organize the ministry, uh, get into uh, specifics, and I can share. Uh, more uh, real life stories and examples. Somebody could please close and pray and we'll dismiss after that. Go ahead, anyone? Pastor, can I pray? Go ahead, please. Thank you. Precious Father, we thank you and praise you, Father God, for this day which you have given to us. Father, every word what we received, oh Father God, we pray that let it deeply rooted in us, O oh God. And let it transform our our way of thinking, let it transform our character. Let it let it let it let it give us the importance to Father God to to organize everything, not only Lord Master in um, in the church, but in our personal life, O oh God. We know that we came to know that, Father God, you are a God of God who who works, O oh Lord Master, systematically. And we, we want to, Lord Master, to live in that way. We surrender everything into your mighty hand. And every word what we listen today, we want, Lord Master, to please preserve it under your blood. Thank you once again for using your servant. In Jesus' most holy and matchless name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It's good to connect and be back together. I uh, really appreciate all of you connecting. and. Uh, Trust we will all have a good semester and a good year. Okay.